okay so in this video i am going to discuss about a very interesting topic that is to make use of model jackers for automatic task generation okay so to understand the process of automatic task generation by means of a model checker first we need to have a brief introduction to the model checking itself so a model checker is basically an algorithm uh, that analyzes the satisfi satisfiability of a logical formula phi against a model m and to say that this model is uh, going to be a formal model <coughs> Sorry. So there are different formalisms. So the choice of formalism will depend upon uh, a specific model checker. For example, you can use a timed uh, automaton for a specific model checker, which handles those kind uh, kind of uh, formalism. <coughs> Likewise, you can also use finite state machines or Kripke structures. For modeling behavior of certain reactive systems and for analyzing such systems we have uh, model checkers that take inputs uh, in these kind of models so what a model checker does is that it will analyze whether this formula holds on the model and we represent this uh, by means of this that the phi satisfies a uh, model, given model m if the formula holds on the model, then it's uh, probably not interesting uh, given our context. So uh, let me uh, clarify at this position that there are two uh, well-known and broad communities that are interesting in uh, analyzing the correctness of programs. One can be called the testing community, and they are interesting. Uh, they are interested to show that uh, a program behaves correctly and there is another community which is which we call the formal verification community these guys are also interested in uh, the correct behavior of the software <coughs> the software testing community they build confidence in the working of the software by detecting faults or bugs from the software on the other hand the formal uh, verification community they are interested in uh, establishing, establishing the correctness of the program by means of correctness proofs. So that's how these uh, communities differ. So this model checking is also uh, an approach basically used by the formal verification community in which they try to establish the correctness of a model against this formula <coughs> and they, they will be interested in ensuring that uh, the formula actually holds on the model and if for instance this formula doesn't hold on a model then uh, a model checker uh, gives a trace or a path in the model along which this phi does not hold the formula does not hold now the formal verification community as i just told you they want to have uh, the proof of correctness established and for that matter, uh, these counterexamples <coughs> are not uh, very much interesting for them. What uh, interests the testing community about this counterexample is that the, the, these are basically uh, suggesting or these are basically reflecting some bad behavior in the model. And that is where uh, testing, uh, the interest of the tester uh, lies, that they, they want to find out where specifically the bad parts of the program <coughs> are so therefore uh, this specific property of the model checker to generate counter examples is used by the testers to find out faults or to make uh, or to use these counter examples as test cases so this is the basically the crux of this uh, whole uh, discussion which i am going to have uh, in the next few videos that we can make use of these counterexamples as interesting test cases because they are telling us something bad about the behavior of the system. So this trace is also called a counterexample uh, to the correctness of the model or a witness to where the property is violated. So this can also be called a trace as we 
mention this bullet it can be called a uh, counter example and it can be called uh, a witness uh, to where the property is violated so as i mentioned on the previous slide that there is a possibility that you can encode uh, the models in different formalisms and the underlying model checker basically uh, does not supports all these formalisms one model checker will be supporting a specific formalism and we have to encode the model <coughs> in terms of the uh, formalism supported by the model checker so for example uh, we have the possibility to write or encode models uh, in <coughs> as uh, finite state machines as finite state machines or as timed automata or as script case structures so the finite state machine and the kripke structures are basically used to model the reactive system and timed automaton uh, or a timed uh, uh, timed automaton are basically used to model timed systems so depending upon these formalisms we will have to look for a model checker which supports encoding the model in these uh, possible formalism there can be other formalisms also but in this uh series of videos i am focusing on uh the first one and mo mostly i will be working on these kripke structures so at the same time uh we are when we we were talking about not just a model we were also talking about some logical formula phi so <coughs> we just discussed that this model can be encoded in different formalisms and the model check underlying model checker which we want to make use of must support uh, the formalism uh, which in which we are trying to model the system in the same way this logical formula <coughs> can also be expressed in different uh, formalisms so two very popular types of formalisms are uh, linear temporal logic or propositional linear temporal logic which we call ltl or pltl and in the same way another type of formalism can be the computational true logic ctl <coughs> so when we have this uh, formula expressed in the form of uh, some formalism like the linear temporal logic or the computational true logic and in the same way we have uh, a formalism for the model and we have a model checker which supports these formalism for the formulas and the models then we will be in the position to analyze the behavior of that uh, model corresponding to that particular formula so once we have these present then we will be in a position or we will be enabled to verify the behavior of these systems so specifically in this series of videos i will be focusing on uh, the reactive systems so now coming to uh, our main topic that is automatic task case generation and we are going to do this uh, in fact we can write this as atcg rather than just tcg so so we have uh, we we know that <coughs> manual construction of test cases is a difficult <coughs> time consuming and an error prone activity <coughs> that requires expertise so it can <coughs> save you a lot of time if you have a strategy uh, in which you can uh, automatically generate test cases so basically uh, there are three main phases uh, in any testing which you perform for a software for example you need to create the tests you need to execute these tests and then you need to evaluate or assign verdicts on these tests so these are three broadly speaking three three main phases in testing so so at the moment we are focusing on the first one that how we can uh, automatically create task cases so th uh, there is a possibility that <coughs> sorry, sorry. you can create test automatically you can execute test automatically and you can evaluate them automatically so a testing tool will be considered very good if it is uh, performing all these tests, uh, phases automatically but in practice uh, there are not many tools that uh, perform all these uh, uh, tasks automatically uh, some tools are very good at creating test cases some will actually go on to <coughs> execute those tests on the system which we want to test and very few tools uh, you will find 
that will actually be assigning verdicts on the outputs of tests. <coughs> Okay, so automatic test case generation or test case generation has remained the holy grail of uh, testing for some time. Holy grail, uh, you mean it, it, testing community is basically very much interested in to home, how we can actually automatically create uh, a lot of tests that can save testers time and help them to test uh, underlying systems in a more efficient way. So the question is, is this even possible? If so, how? So that's what we are going to discuss in the next few videos. And another interesting question is whether we can do this for black box testing or we can do this for white box testing. <clears throat> so in recent years, there has been research that has basically targeted white box testing and we will be discussing some of those mechanisms in which we can uh, by, by using which we can do uh, automatic test case generation for white box testing and then we will see whether we can devise a strategy in the same way for <coughs> automatic test case generation for black box testing so another uh, a very uh, i mean uh, you can say a sort of a topic by the white box testing community is, is to have some level of coverage uh, identified by their test. So if we are generating test cases automatically, definitely we will want to have what sort of coverage we are achieving by those automatically generated test cases. I discussed a couple of slides ago that there are different formulas available. Uh, which can be used by different model checkers. So, and I told you that I am going to make use of uh, finite state machines or Kripke structures for modeling our systems, which we can uh, give as an input to our model checker uh, for automatic task explanation. So, uh, a very uh, s simple model to for the modeling of embedded system is to make use of a deterministic Kripke structure. So this this is uh, analogous to saying a multi-bit Moore machine. So if you recall from your uh, automaton theory course that a uh, Moore machine is a formalism that has a output built to, built into its, its state. So formally, uh, a Moore machine is a tuple which has a finite set of states, a finite set of input symbols, <coughs> an initial state Q0, which is an element of the state set Q, the transition function delta, which takes a state and an input symbol and tells us the next state uh, on this input symbol when we read it from this current state, some current state. Uh, which will be an element of Q. And then we have this uh, lambda, which is our output function. What it does is it maps every state to an n bit, uh, <coughs> sorry, n bit output vector. So for a one bit machine, this n is going to be one. So, for example, if I have make a simple machine here, a one bit machine, that's a Q0 is our initial state and that's a Q1 is some other state. So, when I say that lambda uh, has an n equal to one bit in the output, so for example, let's say this state just has zero output and, and then this next state, Q1, has just one output. Now to make it deterministic and let's say our sigma set has just two input symbols. So I need to give paths for both these A and B for each state. So uh, at the Q set at the moment is just Q0 and Q1. So I am just randomly drawing some uh, uh, transitions from, for each state on each symbol. Let's say I read an A, I go to Q1. Uh, if I read a B from Q0, I stay on Q0 and if I read for example an A, I come back to Q0 
and if I read a B from Q1, I stay on Q1. Now in this case, N is equal to 1. So it is, uh, we have the possibility that we can extend N to any finite number, but uh, for many practical systems, it, it will not be very large. Let's say if we have N equal to 2, then <coughs> we have two bits on each states. Either we have the possibility that we can give us 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1. <coughs> so all these bit config configuration need not appear on each state. Just like when we have just n equal to 1, so uh, not all states can be 0 output, not all states can be 1 output, but uh, there are possibilities that all states are rejecting states or all states are accepting states. So basically, 1 is telling us that uh, this is an accepting state and 0 is telling us that this is a rejecting state. So the point is, it's not necessary that every state has a 0 or every state has a 1. So uh, likewise, when n is equal to 2, then it's not necessary that these all four combinations are present, present on each state or uh, any number of state in the automaton. So you have may have any configuration of bits depending upon the system you are modeling and what sort of outputs that system is going to show uh, corresponding to some input uh, symbol or a sequence of input symbols. So that was that and if uh, you need a further clarification about the transition functions, we can uh, clarify it, uh, again from this diagram. For example, <coughs> in this case, if I want to draw this, let's say I have a Q and a sigma. So I have state Q0, symbol A, state Q0, symbol B, state Q1, symbol A, state Q2, symbol B, and then this part this again need to be uh, some q okay sorry i have to be here so by just looking at this diagram q not a uh, i go to q1 q not b <coughs> i stay on q not q1 a i go to q not and by q to b when i read a uh, so sorry this is q1 I read uh, Q, uh, B on Q1, then I stay on Q1. So this is how a typical transition function of an automaton is uh, computed. And likewise, we can also have uh, the bit vector. If it is 2, for example, n equal to 2, then the bit vector is going to have these values. And let's suppose uh, Q0, sorry, and Q1. The bits on state Q0 are 0, 0 and bits on state Q1 are 1, 1. I, I just hypothetically, for the purpose of explaining what it, it is means to have a, uh, a specific bit vector on a certain state. Okay, <clears throat> so now I am going to model a very simple 2-bit shift register uh, as per the formalism discussed on the previous slide. So this 2-bit shift register has uh, states A, B, C, and D in the set of states Q. And it has two input symbols, 0 and 1. And we say that the state A <coughs> out of these A, B, C, and D is going to be our initial state. Now, how it works is that initially both the bits are 0 uh, in state A. Now, if I read a 1, from state uh, A, which has the output bit 0, 0. So it will, for the purpose of clarification or explaining, I am saying that the red bit is going to be appended on the left and this one is going to be discarded. So the remaining part is going to become the next output. So if I read uh, <coughs> one from a state having output 0, 0, this uh, red bit is going to be appended on the left the rightmost will be discarded. And since it's just a two bit shift register, we cannot have three bits. We, we are going to discard the rightmost bit. So the remaining bits uh, are going to become the output of the next state. In the same way, when I read one zero, uh, the state is B and the output is one zero. I read a one, it, <coughs> that is going to be appended on the left. Rightmost will be discarded. And <coughs> the next state output will be 1, 1, which I just showed here. Now, if I read a 1 from state D, this transition, so again, 
<coughs> I will append a one on the right. I will discard the rightmost. So I will remain in this state. If, for example, I read a zero from state having output uh, one one, then what happens? I append a zero on the left. I will discard the rightmost. So I will move to a state which has output zero one. And in the same way, you can append uh, one on the left, discard this one. <coughs> and if you read a one from here, you will reach a state with <coughs> excuse me, uh, output having one zero. And similarly, if I read one, uh, zero from a state having output one zero, it will be appending on the left. I will discard. So I will take this path. So I will reach a state having 0, 1 output which I just showed. Now if I have the output 0, 1 and I read 0 from there, I append it on the left, I discard the rightmost and I end up in a state which has uh, two zeros in the output. And the same can be done for this state uh, having output 0. <coughs> so we append the 0 on the left which we just read <coughs> and we just discard the rightmost so I remain on the state having uh, two zero bits in its output. <coughs> I'm sorry. So this is how you basically uh, model a two bit shift register in the form of a, a deterministic Kripke structure as we as I just told on the previous slide that uh, a deterministic Kripke structure is just a generalization for a Moore machine. A Moore machine we generally uh, when we normally discuss in an automaton theory book that is just having one bit in the output, but we generalize it for n bits. And in this case, we just model it for n equal to two. And <coughs> we took a very simple toy example or practical example uh, that helps us to illustrate the concept of a deterministic Kripke structure. And basically we are going to use this uh, to demonstrate the test case generation process by means of a model checker. Okay, so this is just another representation of the uh, deterministic Kripke structure I demonstrated on the previous slide, but this is just uh, another way of representing the same thing. So what my intention is that I want to take closer uh, to the syntax of the model checker, uh, which we are going to use for uh, this purpose uh, of automatic task generation. And in, in that model checker, we are going to represent bits in this way. So these are just Boolean variables, not bit 1, <coughs> not bit 2. These are basically telling that two bits uh, on this state are uh, both having value false. And this bit configuration here, first bit is true and the second one is false. Here the first bit is false and the second one is true. And then the last state, D state, uh, both the bits are true. So this was state A, this was state B, this was state C, and this was state D on the previous line. So I'm, I'm going to make use of this example in the uh, next sections of videos or the, on the coming videos.